Oh, by the way, I am uh, working in George Mason University in Krasnov Institute, together with Ken Dion and George Raskol. Uh, the general challenge that uh, you all probably are concerned with is how to build a competition appearance of the human mind, taking the highest cognitive abilities. Of course, we cannot build exact equivalent of anything that happens in our mind. And, uh, well, the bottom line is that there are two approaches. One is to build it piece by piece, like uh, first we build uh, vision, then audition, then motion control, then language processing. At the end, we may want to build intelligence. Or we start with something small and let it grow by teaching. And so, what the learning mode is actually so, teaching uh, uh, implies learning. And uh, so therefore, we need a universal learner. And uh, so one fundamental question that uh, emerges here is, what is the minimal critical mass that enables uh, virtual unlimited learning? Like, you can teach it whatever you know. And well, one possible answer is that it is basically our biker. Junior bike architecture vision, uh, which has the four, uh, the three, the three uh, main building blocks like the schema, which, approximately speaking, is just a format of representation of knowledge, cognitive map, which I address in the second half of the talk, and self, which intuitively means the sense of me present here in this room, which a computer doesn't have a practically in a very simplistic level, it means just some uh, organization of the working method. But when I look now at this architecture and listen to uh, John's talk, I see that all architectures start to converge to something common, and this is very good. So I see that both symbolic and non-symbolic approaches start to converge, even though we had originally very different notions for the self, for the episodic memory, emotions, uh, matter recognition. Now I see a lot of common with John Lyre's architecture and, well, hopefully, eventually, we will have something that, that is close also to, to the human mind. So, here is just to show you the rapid prototype which was fully implemented with architecture, Jamie Piper. It is a virtual robot that learns uh, an indoor environment. And we see all these uh, schemas and uh, instances of working memory are uh, actually represented. Here is a uh, modern higher level implementation of what it could do potentially in some other paradigms. So, just briefly mentioning this, now I have to look at this from a different perspective. Uh, let's say the goal is to understand student learning in order to solve education problems. But find it from, from the other part. Yes. Terminated now the different sources, so we, we shift our focus of thinking here. And what if we cannot do experiments in the classroom and we cannot reproduce the authentic classroom setting in the laboratory? Then we have to use computational approach. And why not use the same way to solve this problem? So, uh, what is college constructor? Well, it is a multi-dimensional, multi-modal thing. It is going to be a rapid prototype of bike, a linguist and a conversational agent, an electronic student and a metal learner, an automatic programmer, for example, if you select this domain of teaching, for example. A virtually embodied intelligent agent and a cognitive engineer, and that is the expand the data, which justifies the term cognitive constructor. So why do I call it cognitive constructor? Because we implement a virtual micro world for it, which represents the domain of knowledge. For example, it, it is the uh, elementary school science or high school physics, which has not only uh, diagrams representing uh, physical objects like blocks and rods, it also has uh, elements representing concepts like forces or even instances of equilibrium of forces, which are treated at the same level as objects in this world. Okay? So now, by manipulating these objects, you can actually do some learning simply by constructing 
starting from blocks, right? And then blocks form. It's okay. Uh, so in this case, the student has also interface with this world, and uh, the, the simulation goes in parallel, so the student can actually learn from the agent and teach the agent questions. Here's an example of how to do an automatic program. Uh, in this case, you have three levels, like uh, each schema is, a, is represented symbolically as before. It also has a linguistic component, which allows to invoke it verbally, and the code associated with it, which produces the implementation. So by combining the schemas, you actually produce the code. Uh, I have to skip, actually, several uh, examples. The second example was learning by reading, which appears to require a lot of dimensions like embodiment, uh, guidance by human instructor, and so on. So the conclusion for this part would be that uh, we need to reproduce elements of the human, human mind in order to uh, understand the process of student, student learning. The, the, the task involves uh, multi-dimensions in, in a sense that it requires virtual embodiment and interactions with the human, in particular with the human mind. And the uh, fundamental scientific problem is identifying this critical mass. So uh, this and many other topics, hopefully, will be discussed in this fall, in the AAAI fall symposium, which uh, Ben and I are trying to organize. So uh, I obviously would like to invite you all to come, given that the application will be approved. Things like that. So keep watching for the AAA website. Now uh, I go back to the notion of cognitive mind. And the idea in this case is to organize concepts in some abstract space in order to capture semantics geometrically. So that similar concepts would be close to each other, like synonyms, and acronyms would be separated far apart. To give an example, here is what you can do with colors, just by arranging them based on RGB coordinates. You see similar colors are close to each other, uh, opposite colors are on the opposite side. Well, the question is, can you do this with words? Well, the answer is yes, the short answer is yes, if you start by embedding words as vectors in abstract multidimensional space, uh, constructing this energy function, optimizing configuration of vectors to minimize this energy function. So what you get is uh, some distribution of English words uh, so that synonyms again are close to each other and synonyms are far apart. Which is similar uh, for very different dictionaries. And it is a global dimension. So these are the principal components. You see only four significant principal components in one dictionary and one five in another. And how many dimensions uh, world have that? Uh, so these are pictures for several other languages. Uh, here are sorted list of words, so, so you can actually see the semantics for the, for the first principal component, which gives a sense of positive. That actually, it is not just predominant, it's 100%. 100% selection of words that are positive. So if you take the opposite side of the list, they are all negative. If you look at the other principal component, they are all exciting. Here, they, they are all common, and uh, you can see uh, the third dimension, open various clothes, and then you see uh, in German dictionary the same distribution. And uh, so the question is, well, you can measure correlation and prove that there is consistency across languages, across dictionaries, by mapping words across these maps. How can you apply this? Well, you can do semantic twisting by taking all synonyms of a word and ranking them by those dimensions, selecting those that you want. Or you can, let's say, take a bunch of MacLine abstracts, uh, compute the center of mass of each abstract by index of words in this map, and then select the most exciting, uh, let's say the most exciting abstract, the most common, the most uh, <laughs> negative, the most positive. So here's the most positive abstract. I highlighted the words that probably caused it to be most positive. Here is the most negative. Here is the, the most common, and here is the most exciting. I would never imagine that this would be published as an abstract in a journal, but it is. <laughs> it was instantly found among 500 abstracts. Instantly found, okay? So I can do the same, I can do the same with Shakespeare's sonnet. This is the most positive sonnet. 
And this is the most <laughs> negative Shakespeare song you can see, <laughs> what it says here. Okay? I can do the same with jokes. And, okay, basically, this, this is it. So I'm uh, just announcing that this Comptium app is available for everybody who is willing to test and do whatever you want with it. I have it even now with me on the job, right? I can give it to you for free and you can try to, uh, to have fun yourself. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.